Hi everyone and welcome to session six on open synthesis. My name is Kira Keenan and I am on the organising committee of ESMAR Conf and I hope you've all been really enjoying it so far. So this session will run for approximately 75 minutes um, and it's going to feature six short but wonderful presentations followed by a panel discussion led by our invited discussants who are Liam Toomey, Tamara Lofty and David Moher. Um, if you'd like to join the discussion at the end, then please post your questions and or even your opinions on our dedicated Slack channel, which is hashtag questions for presenters or tag ES Hackathon on Twitter. So without further ado, we will kick off now with our very own Neil Hathaway, who's going to present on Open Synthesis and R. I'm going to introduce the concept of open synthesis and how it relates to maximizing efficiency, rigor, transparency, impact, and legacy of evidence syntheses and meta-analyses. I wanted to start off just by talking about open science. It's obviously very important to the topic. There have been a number of different taxonomies and definitions set out to explain the key elements of open science, but in principle, they all uh, relates to the idea that it should be making science as accessible to the public as possible. There are various different uh, advantages and disadvantages that have been reported in relation to open science. Some of the advantages include things like more rigorous peer review, the fact that publicly funded research is publicly available, which perhaps is a mandate, the um, increased level of reproducibility and transparency of research, and related to that, a greater impact in open science research, and that open collaborations can support high complexity analyses. Some of the disadvantages relate to the fear of possible misuse of data in research, the risk that the public may misunderstand that research, there could be an exacerbation in the volume of poor quality research, and any existing power imbalances may be made worse by uh, the push towards open science. Before I move on to evidence synthesis, I wanted to um, think about closed evidence syntheses. Um, perhaps in many ways, the status quo of evidence syntheses, um, if not now, then recently. Some of the common issues with closed evidence syntheses are that they could suffer from uh, selective or incomplete reporting. Uh, and that's where the data or results that we're seeing may not be representative of the full analyses conducted. It could be that um, there's a lack of methodological detail, making it difficult to verify or uh, replicate the methods used. Some research is paywalled and can't be accessed. Uh, the research that has analyses uh, in involving code may not provide that code in a format that's reproducible. Where data is provided, it may be unclear or unusable. There may be uh, a waste in resources caused by uh, closed syntheses, um, particularly where there's a lack of collaboration or networking. Where people aren't honest about their um, potential interests in a topic, uh, and those conflicts of interest could be a problem, it's difficult to verify whether we can have trust in the, the analyses that have been done. Closed evidence syntheses may also uh, mislead decision makers if they're not reliable. And where a review uh, is attempted to be updated, it's very difficult to do so if the original review is closed and everything has to be done from scratch. The Open Synthesis Working Group is um, a group of people interested in the application of open science to evidence synthesis. And over the last uh, 12 months or so, they've been discussing um, a draft framework for open synthesis. And I wanted to share this, um, what is a draft framework for the key elements of how open science might relate to evidence synthesis. First of all, there's a concept of open collaboration, um, and that's non-selective opportunities for collaboration in evidence syntheses and meta-analyses. Open discovery, which is the, uh, the use of bibliographic databases that are free to use and free to export data from. Open methods, which relates to detailed methodology, which is freely accessible, describing the planned or uh, eventual methods involved in a synthesis, synthesis or a review. 
Open data, which we're probably all familiar with, which is freely accessible data. Open source, which relates to freely accessible software code for any programs that are developed within a review. Uh, open code, which relates to freely accessible analytic code within a, a synthesis or meta-analysis. Open access, which again, we're probably all familiar with and relates to freely accessible manuscripts and full texts. Open peer review, which relates to freely accessible peer review reports. Open education, which relates to freely accessible training materials. And open interests, relating to de um, the open declaration of financial and non-financial interests for all review authors. And the Open Synthesis Working Group will discuss what each of these might mean uh, whether they're all integrally, uh, integral parts of open synthesis uh, and any potential disadvantages or um, things that need to be look at, looked out for when trying to provide practical advice on being more open in evidence syntheses and meta-analyses. Open synthesis is important um, for a number of reasons. Firstly, evidence synthesis itself relies on the openness of the primary research that we are synthesizing. So we're often having to deal with hurdles around the openness of primary research. And as a result, we should be more aware and more, uh, more open to being open ourselves. In addition, um, evidence synthesis is already built on many open science principles. So for example, we already use open methods in systematic reviews where an a priori protocol is published in advance that outlines the methodology we plan to use. There are also reporting standards that help to ensure that the methods we're reporting are highly detailed and uh, reproducible um, and as reproducible as possible, like Prisma and Roses. But the linkages between open science and evidence synthesis so far haven't been explicit. And that means that the potential benefits of open science haven't been fully appreciated in evidence synthesis. We've also seen um, already, as we've seen in this presentation, evidence syntheses are often insufficiently open. And so the concept of open synthesis aims to explicitly define how openness should be applied in evidence synthesis and what the potential benefits might be. And those benefits are that it um, helps to facilitate full transparency and in particular digital transparency. It helps to uh, verify the results and conclusions of reviews and therefore increase the level of re reliability that we might have and the trust that we might have in syntheses and meta-analyses. Um, it can also help to increase and improve the access to resources um, in low and middle income countries or participation by low and middle income countries because of removing that um, financial barrier. It can also help to facilitate data reuse, for example, where we want to understand the methods used across the topic area. Uh, some people call this meta research. And it can help to increase the efficiency of review conduct by sharing work across people. It can also reduce the need for requests for information from corresponding authors, many of which we've experienced, um, which are often um, not particularly successful or may have a, a low efficiency or a big time lag. And it can help to raise awareness of and capacity building for the conduct of rigorous evidence syntheses. And finally, increase the impact of evidence syntheses by um, ensuring that the evidence syntheses are more reliable, uh, they're more rigorous, and they're easier to find and use and integrate into further research. Thank you so much, Neil. And I think we can all agree that you're already doing much of the work on increasing the impact of evidence syntheses through events like these. So next, we're going to welcome Tanya Borgott, who is a PhD student at the Leibniz Institute for Psychology in Trier, Germany. So Tanya is going to present on a platform which is used for open meta-analyses in psychology. So thank you. I just have to start the presentation. So do you see that now? Okay. So good afternoon and thank you for having me here. Um, at my institute, I'm responsible for a 
platform for open and cumulative media analyses in psychology and neighboring fields called Psych Open Karma. And I will present this platform to you now. It is a test version that will be released within the next few weeks or months. For further questions on the project, you can contact me via email or have a talk after the presentation. Why do we need a platform for open censuses at all? So I guess we just had Nia's great talk on open censuses and we saw similar systems in yesterday evening session on user interfaces and we saw MetaLab today. Um, so I will keep this short. Uh, we all know um, a, to have a platform for open censuses allows us to modify analysis inputs. Um, so for example, choose other moderator variables we can use um, the data that is already collected for further analysis purposes. And especially in rather active research areas, the evidence of meter analyses may outdate fast. And access to the data set and the thorough documentation of the, of the methodology makes it easier to update a meter analysis efficiently. So the basic concept of a KAMA, which stands for Community Augmented Media Analysis, um, is to store media analytic data in a repository and provide the user a graphical interface where he can conduct dynamic media analyses with the data from the repository. Um, so researchers on the one side can provide data to implement their media analyses on the platform or to extend existing media analyses. And at the same time, they can use the functionalities of the graphical user interface to get a quick overview on the evidence on a topic and to replicate a media analysis. As we have seen during SMAR out uh, during this whole conference is that most interfaces rely on our shiny architectures. We are a research infrastructure institute and there were technical reasons concerning user accounts, scalability, and connection to our other services, um, why we chose to build Psych Open Karma as a PHP web application. And um, the whole thing functions uh, from, from, from the user side, we get requests to the Karma application and these requests are translated and sent to an open CPU server. On this server, we have a self-maintained R package comprising standardized Karma data as well as meta-analytic functions for the web application. The functions rely mainly, as always, um, on Metaphor. We also used MetaWith and Demeter for some visualizations. The data have to be standardized concerning naming and data structure. And moreover, we use machine readable metadata for each meta analysis to make the functions of the package work for different meta analyses in psychology. So our functions have to be generic and interoperable. The computations are executed within this R server and the corresponding outputs are given back to the user via the graphical interface. And now I will give you a quick demonstration of the look and feel of the platform by using our test version that is almost ready for release and we, we already use it with collaboration partners, for example. So I will start this one to prevent technical difficulties, I hope. Um, I want to start the video, so now it functions. First, we um, select the data set in the domain of personality here, and we have the documentation for the data. And we see here that we can um, sort the data table according to each variable. So we can easily find out that the data includes effect sizes from two to 2002 to 18. Then we have um, the possibility to explore the data to get an overview of the distributions of the effect size of interest and various moderator variables. So here, for example, we chose publication year as a numeric and publication status as a categorical moderator and get a crude scatter plot. Um, we also have, um, for example, violin plots. Here we have um, two subgroups, um, studies uh, conducted in one laboratory and studies conducted in other ones. Um, then we have um, basic meta analytic analyses. Um, here we, we choose a meta regression model, a mixed effects model with two moderators, number of items and laboratory. 
and uh, we automatically get the output and see that laboratory has no relevant effect on the sex differences. Uh, so, um, a growing number of items increases the differences. And here we are in the publication bias. Uh, so we can get a funnel plot and a contour enhanced funnel that we see here. Um, and we also um, have uh, P curves within the system. So um, here, for example, we can see the, the blue P curve is the one that we have here and it does not indicate P hacking. And finally, we also want to estimate the power of a prospective new study with a sample size of 50 and a significance level of 5%. And the estimate from the corresponding meta-analysis is assumed as crew effect size and represented as the curve in the middle. And based on this information, um, we get the probability um, of 89% for, um, um, to find a true effect size with a study with 50 participants. So um, this was a quick tour through the system. Hopefully you will be able to try out the survey for yourselves in detail soon. Um, there are still challenges and developments needed to increase the benefit of Psych Open Karma. Um, on the side of data acquisition, we can use data of pre-registered studies collected in our laboratory Psych Lab. If the studies are eligible for an already existing meta-analysis, for meta-analyses published in one of the journals of our open access publishing platform Psych Open, um, we could, uh, for example, ask authors to share the meta-analytic data of the meta-analysis. To assist the data submission from the user side, we want to use our own submission tool within Psych Archives um, and to make uh, the data used for further analyses easier for the user, we will connect Psych Open Karma to Psych Notebook, our Jupyter Lab Notebook for Psychology that will also be released soon. Users will be able to use the meta-analytic data in a free R environment within their own accounts. As we can see, as a central research infrastructure institute for psychology, we and our users can greatly benefit from synergy effects with other tools and services, but still we have a long way to go to connect all these uh, services. So thank you for your attention. Excellent, Tanya, and thank you so much for that. Um, personally, it's great to see the interaction between other services too. So our third speaker today is Mark Legioness, and he will be chatting about automating some data extraction and possible challenges that are associated with that. Hi, um, my name is Mark Legioness, and I'm an ecologist at the University of South Florida. And I got three things I wanna talk about today. One is a diversity of tools available to extract data from plots. Two, talk about a little bit of how I um, spent some time developing those tools and failed miserably like a meteor shard crashing into earth. And three, um, this really is the take home message is um, what can we do now to improve or enhance uh, semi-automated tools or fully automated tools to extract data from plots. And um, there's a, uh, it's quite simple really. And we, uh, the idea is to just start advocating for cleaner plotting practices. So what's out there right now, right? Uh, Web plot digitizer is by far the heavyweight and you got to give credit to Ankit for making this open access for more than a decade. Um, in terms of R, we got Meta Digitize, which is also a popular one, but I'm gonna talk about Metagear, which has kind of been my uh, Frankenstein for uh, years now. And uh, originally I had devised Metagear to be solely a data extraction um, toolkit. Uh, and if one of the first things I developed for it was the semi-automated tools to extract data. And what I mean by semi-automated is uh, we're using uh, object detection algorithms to uh, pull out numerical values from the plots. And I was really happy that I was, I was able to pull that together in R, but uh, the meat hook reality of it all though is that uh, no one has ever used Metagear for extracting data from plots. And this is a very sad on my part because I spent a lot of time um, 
uh, developing those tools. And, and the lessons learned from that um, have been clear for many, many years. One is the package suffered from dependency rot for a long time. Um, but the other thing was like I, the way I presented the data extraction tools was in a modeling uh, framework, right? And so uh, you would have a function, you would optimize different parameters to try to best extract data from your plot. Years ago, I developed an, an interface for, for the data extractions to faci facilitate the semi-automated tools. I never released it. I don't know why. That's part of my MO these last few years is to do put a whole bunch of work into stuff and never do anything with it. Um, but the, the idea is you have like a window, you press a button, and it just like figures it out for you, right? And it get, tells you what is difficult to separate and what is... Um, uh, has been identified in the plot. Now here, here is the challenge with these semi-automated tools. This graph right here is an absolutely beautiful, clean graph. And so it's easy to tease apart, pull out numbers from that. But in reality, no two figures are the same. Um, and, and maybe for good reason, because, you know, we as scientists, we really get few opportunities to um, be creative. And figures is one of these things where we could uh, spend some time, make things look nice. But the problem is, is when you make things look nice uh, and make it more readable for humans, chances are you're making it more difficult for a machine to read the image. And so from the rest of my uh, talk here, I'm going to talk about how we could um, advocate for plotting practices that facilitate, that open up these data to machines, to semi-automated, fully automated tools to read figures. And there's a bunch of examples out there that are, are emerging. And um, they made it great for scientists to uh, communicate their outcomes. But again, they, they break some fundamental rules in plotting and object detection in, in figures. So here's a collection of stuff I know have historically hung up the automation of image extractions. ggplot. I love you, ggplot, and I hate you at the same time. It's a quantum thing. You do not present axes. And one of the first things in object detection and trying to figure out um, the coordinates of things within a plot is to figure out where the axes are in the first place. So shame on you, ggplot. Uh, vanilla R, base R, you do funny stuff too once in a while. You like to divorce the axes. This is not a nice thing to do <laughs> in terms of uh, making it uh, easily readable to uh, a machine to extract data because the axes, again, absolutely crucial to figuring this stuff out. Text and plots, great for humans. We know exactly the identity of individual points, but this is noise. This is noise when it comes to a machine trying to figure out the points. A lot of letters are similar to uh, the points you plot on a graph. This, I'm not too sure what this is. This is like using images instead of plot points. How do you figure out the center of these images? That's a something that is um, difficult for a machine to figure out because they're trying to look for consistency in plotting objects. This is actually pretty nice, right? They individually, these plots, we could extract uh, in a semi-automated way fairly quickly. The issue here is all these plots are wrapped up into a single image. And so if you extract images from a PDF or online, it's all uh, embedded in a single image that's just another layer that causes headaches for um, automated tools because now they have to segment the image to identify individual plots. And then there's a whole load of variations on this stuff. You have mixed plots, right? Mixing scatter plots with bar plots. You have high density plots. And then you have like multiple Y axis plots. These are all uh, things that hang up semi-automated tools or fully automated tools to extract data. So uh, my take home message is um, a call to arms. We could, we could nip this in the butt 
by just advocating for cleaner plotting practices. And there's a weird tension, right? There's the tension of a humans wanting to present their outcomes in a clear way, and then machines being able to make sense of, of those plots. And all the embellishments we add to plotting scientific data just make it harder for um, automated tools. And if the goal is to make information more open, um, then we should also try to make it more open for uh, machine readability also. So that's, that's my main message. I'd be glad to take questions um, given a chance. Thank you for letting me talk. Thank you, Mark. I, I really thoroughly enjoyed that. And I might need to take some presenting tips from you in the future. Really incredible. So thank you as well for being so honest about those problems so that the rest of us could avoid that in the future too. Um, and I would be really interested in, in the best practice guide that you talked about in, in your pre-recorded video. And um, so next I'm going to welcome Thomas Luchtefeld, who will talk about sysrev.com, which is an open access platform for review and something that I personally use very regularly. So over to you, Thomas. Hi, Tom. Hi, having a few difficulties over here. Just one second. Okay, um, I think we have a pre-recorded video, so we'll line that up in case. Okay, yeah, I think it would probably be good to go with the video. Are you okay to line that up, Neil? Sure thing. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tom Luchtefeld, and I'm gonna be talking to you about sysrev.com a free open access programmable review platform. And uh, SysRef can be really helpful for putting together systematic reviews or for just extracting data from documents. So what is a SysRev? Uh, SysRevs are projects on SysRev.com where you upload articles or any kind of digital document. Uh, those could come from a PubMed search, from PDFs, or actually any kind of custom data format you want. So you upload articles to a SysRev you then define review tasks. These are questions you're going to ask reviewers. Uh, things like, should this article be included or not included? You're creating a screening review. Uh, or you could be asking to extract uh, answers to difficult questions, like what was the species studied in this paper or what were the outcomes of this paper? Uh, so you collect articles, define review tasks, and then Sysrev helps you distribute those review tasks to reviewers whom you invite to your project. Uh, so projects can have one reviewer or they can have hundreds of reviewers. Uh, CISRF handles the process of distributing those tasks and actually it starts to automate those tasks as, as well. Uh, CISRF has a built-in machine learning uh, platform and so every time your reviewers are reviewing labels, CISRF is learning how to replicate those tasks. Now finally, at any stage in the review, you can export the results uh, into, a, into a spreadsheet format uh, or, or several other formats as well. CISREV is open access, uh, so you can create a, what we call a public project on CISREV.com, and these are projects that are accessible to the World Wide Web. Uh, if you go to CISREV.com slash search and search for cancer, you'll find a whole bunch of projects that people have done uh, reviewing cancer. Uh, this helps to reduce redundancy in this space, and it helps to make your work discoverable. Uh, public projects aren't only discoverable on CISREV.com, but we've worked to make sure that Google and Bing and every search engine can easily find public projects. And so if you go on Google and search for CISREV Eris, you'll be able to find all the reviews done by the Eris Surgical Group on CISREV. If you go on Bing and search for CISREV Gene Hunter, you'll be able to find uh, reviews that we did about identifying genes and text, which I'll come back to in a minute. Of course, once you've found a project, you still have to do uh, something with that project. And uh, something we've also introduced in CISREV, that's, a, that's uh, we think a kind of new idea in this space, is the idea of clonable projects. Uh, and so in this project done by the Gessie Group and Tamara Lotfi, who I, I think is presenting here today, uh, there was a project created to understand uh, migrants and refugees in, in a corpus of documents they were looking at. Now they wanted to replicate this project across eight different groups. And rather than have to create that project over and over again with the same labels, 
uh, the Gessie group was able to just clone that project eight, eight times. And what you're seeing here are just bar charts uh, showing you the distribution of answers extracted from documents that they were looking at. Uh, you could compare these distributions if you wanted, but the point is that you can go to any project on CISRA of any public project and clone those labels. You can even clone the documents if you want. Uh, this makes it much easier to create templates and we hope makes it easier to uh, sort of distribute new ideas within the systematic review space. Now I'd also like to talk briefly about how CISRA is programmable. Uh, and before I get into that, I wanna introduce you to a project we did a little more than a year ago uh, called Gene Hunter. In Gene Hunter, we invited 10 reviewers to extract genes from titles and abstracts. Here you can see that a reviewer is extracting YY1 uh, from this article uh, about structure regulators of enhancer promoter loops. Uh, so they extract that gene and this process is done. Uh, we did it on about 2000 abstracts. And after a little while, uh, you, you collect enough data to build a machine learning algorithm, a named entity recognition algorithm uh, that can automate this process. And uh, I'll show you how to do that in just a second, but it's worth pointing out that once you have this algorithm, if it's good, then you can scale up this process. So you could, for example, search for all the abstracts on longevity and automate the extraction of genes in those abstracts. Uh, if you know anything about the longevity literature, you'll know that these genes are probably the genes you would expect. And if you listen to Cynthia Kenyon's talk, uh, she's a famous researcher in longevity at Calico Labs, uh, you'll see her talking about many of the same genes. And so basically what I've taken you through is the process of creating a CISREV, extracting genes from documents in a CISREV, automating that process, and scaling it up to a large number of documents. The same sort of process uh, can, can be useful in many other domains and for many different kinds of NAD detection, like maybe detecting chemicals, for instance. So how would you do it? Well, you'd have to create a CISREV review uh, for actually doing the process of extracting genes from literature or whatever entity you have. Uh, but then you could go to github.com uh, pycisrev, our, our Python CISREV client, and you could import that into a Python project and then extract all of your annotations to, uh, into a Python object. And we've made that Python object specifically so that it works well with Spacey, uh, which is an is a NLP uh, package. And here you can see how you would create an, a Spacey model for identifying genes and text, uh, given the Gene, gene Hunter uh, annotations. And the training process is quite simple as well. So you can notice that there's an NLP object here, which can be used now after training to identify genes and text. How would you do that? Here's the training steps again. You could just do doc is equal to NLP, put in a sentence, and then you can display the results. Here you can see us running, running the algorithm on this sentence. You can see MLH1 uh, being identified in a sentence. Again, this is Spacey. Uh, this is using Spacey and PySysRev. Uh, Spacey is a great package. We don't develop that, Spacey does. And uh, yeah, there's a great combination here. You can go to blog.sysrev.com slash simpleNER to see how to do this yourself. Many of you may be R developers. Uh, if you work with R, we have a package for that as well uh, called rsysrev. It's still in active development, so we'd love if you came and worked with us on it and let us know what features you, you'd like to see in it. Uh, but if you wanted to extract all of the, all of the answers, all, all, of the, all of the information you've extracted in a review, it's really just two lines. Uh, you have to install the project. You have to import the library as well and uh, get your token. Uh, those steps are pretty simple and they're described on github.com slash sysrev slash rsysrev. But then getting your, your data frame out of that is, is really, really easy. You just use rsysrev, get level answers and put in your project identifier and you get a big table out. If you wanna work with this, we'd really love to talk to you and you should certainly contact us. Uh, we'd love to set up some integrations for sysrev. So finally, if you're a developer, we really wanna build integrations with you, please contact us. If you're a researcher, we think you should use sysrev.com. It's free and it's only $10 a month for some of our advanced tools. If you're an organization, you should talk to us about institutional license. We're actually already working with the Kennedy Krieger Institute to use sysrev in the classroom. And uh, if you're an organization outside of education, you should talk to us about managed review. Uh, we can help you build these machine learning algorithms. We can help you uh, set up complex review projects. So if any of this is of interest to you, please contact me at tomatandsilica.co uh, or just go to sysrev.com. Okay, uh, thank you very much.
Thanks a million. And Tom, as you know, I regularly use SysRev um, and also use it as a teaching tool for my review teams. Um, and one thing I really love about your team is, is how responsive you are to user requests. Um, it almost seems instantly, you know, the new feature appears. So thanks for that as well. So our next speaker today is Alexander Bannock-Brown, who will discuss how we can create a research ecosystem between um, our users and or, as is in the case here, um, evidence synthesis methodologists. So over to you, Alexandra. Hi, I'm Alex Bannock-Brown, based at the Quest Centre at the Berlin Institute of Health. And today I'm going to discuss research ecosystems and the role of R in effective evidence synthesis, how we can build bridges between researchers. To give you some background, I work in evidence synthesis in translational biomedicine. We take evidence from preclinical research and synthesize it to inform decisions for clinical research and to refine and improve our own experiments. Systematic reviews and preclinical research are not very common. Primary research reports are not reported in very standardized ways. And of course, the evidence synthesis process is a very resource intensive one. Our aim is to create research ecosystems in biomedicine to increase good quality research and to improve the translation of biomedical findings to improve human health. Where preclinical research is informed by systematic reviews and where preclinical research is synthesizable. So what are research ecosystems? Open research ecosystems are communities of researchers, evidence synthesis, tool makers, information specialists, data managers, etc. that collaboratively recognize evidence synthesis as the end goal of research. Research ecosystems support researchers to design, undertake and report primary research and evidence synthesis in a way that optimizes reuse, translation and sharing of data and methods. And research ecosystems are based on shared open principles, transparency of research methods and data, both in evidence synthesis and primary research. On the left here, we've got the current evidence synthesis system. Reviewers are separated from the research process. Data could be uh, missing if it is not published and then does not get synthesized. Synthesis is a resource intensive task and evidence synthesis also may be delayed in relation to when new data is available. On the right, we've got our future goal that systematic reviewers are embedded within the research process, supporting researchers to conduct evidence synthesis in their own domain. Data is available for synthesis and may even be directly available for synthesis, bypassing um, reports in the traditional published manner. And the processes of evidence synthesis and the reports of evidence synthesis are also open to the public and stakeholders. To realize this idea, we are working to build research ecosystems in translational biomedical research, a project excitingly we've recently got some funding to kickstart. We're working to increase education about systematic reviews in biomedicine. We're working to provide widespread infrastructure for researchers and um, both to conduct systematic reviews and also to conduct reproducible primary research. We're bringing together stakeholders to support this, um, both preclinical researchers, systematic reviews, uh, systematic review methodologists, statisticians, information specialists, as well as patient advocates uh, and others. We're working to create a community code of conduct for what it means to be part of such a research ecosystem and how we can best work together, including the best structure and format for this ecosystem and for the communication. And we're exploring additional uh, infrastructure that may be needed in future in order to allow for the growth of the ecosystem. And infrastructure here is really key to supporting the widespread growth and uptake of evidence synthesis. And Brian Nosek's cultural change pyramid really highlights this. Infrastructure is the foundation, allowing it, to, um, allowing it to be possible and supporting all other steps so that we can build communities to make these practices normative. And R is a wonderful infrastructure framework and existing community that already supports and is closely linked to the principles of open evidence and open research ecosystems. And the number of tools that we already have available is highlighted in this amazing conference. We're building, testing, validating and integrating new, or new tools all the time. 
We have tools to support the evidence synthesis process and tools to automate the steps um, in evidence synthesis process. We've got tools to engage with external databases and other tools. And we've also got tools to export our synthesis and share these results and findings with others. But surrounding this more broadly, we have groups and tools that support evidence synthesis frameworks and support these communities. We also have education um, and tools to support education, both for systematic review methodology, but also education on how to use these tools themselves. And most importantly, we have um, we have tools to support integrating primary research into the evidence synthesis pipeline. Um, existing tools for cleaning experimental data, building reproducible analysis code, um, and tools to help us um, disseminate our data and our, res uh, and our research. And just wanted to draw attention to the talk that Emily Hennessy gave yesterday about making primary research synthesizable. And we can use our existing overlapping communities to build pipelines, to make best use of the existing tools, to collectively identify gaps for new tools, and to share these best practices that we've got. On top of infrastructure and tools, it's important to build a strong community based around clear shared values. And that's something that we're working towards in translational biomedicine. Transparency of methods, uh, of data, of research processes, ensuring quality that we foster open reproducible research, both primary as well as meta research and that research and data are open and fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, and that we have these best practices of workflows and best practices in, uh, in data sharing in practical solutions. And that's something that reflies, relies on effective communication, using existing platforms for optimizing how we communicate, Slack, forums, conferences, etc how we can set clear standards, values, and how we can shape our role um, as community members by setting codes of conduct to ensure that the community that we're a part of is fair for all. And support, how we can support each other in realizing these goals. Um, a starting place that we're working with is um, fostering, sharing, and learning. For example, with introductory workshops to reproducible research in R, introductory workshops to systematic reviews and evidence synthesis. These are just some of the workshops we deliver at Charité in Berlin. And I think support is a great place to finish up because support both within, uh, within the community, supporting each other, but also support from out with the community, out with the immediate community, engaging with other communities um, that can help us grow. And I think support really underpins a strong community um, and helps us achieve the goal of open research ecosystems not just in biomedicine, um, but for everyone. And just briefly, I've presented some of the work today um, that we're applying a research ecosystems and this approach in biomedicine. Um, this is really work in progress. Um, thank you very much for listening, and I'm really looking forward to um, hearing your thoughts and engaging in discussions uh, on Slack. Thank you. Um, I love what you said about shared values and supporting each other within the community, but really importantly, engaging with people outside the community as well. So that was excellent. So our final presentation today is by Matteo Mancini, who is a research fellow at the University of Sussex. And Matteo will speak a little bit about building um, executable research articles. Thanks, Matteo. Hi, um, I will be talking a bit about uh, executable research articles and why they uh, are um, uh, a potential added value for uh, meta-analysis and systematic reviews. So let's start uh, with uh, um, a thought experiment. Uh, what is the what we expect to find in a generic meta-analysis or in a systematic review? Well, for uh, most people, uh, uh, especially the ones who are not from uh, the hardcore statistics field, it's uh, it's a table, and uh, it's a useful table since it's uh, 
summing up uh, what we are looking for, otherwise we would need to go through uh, the, the section of the paper, but still has limitation. And these limitations overlap with the ones uh, of uh, static reviews and more in general static papers. So the first one is about usability and readability, since uh, to actually uh, get the, all the information we need, we need to go sequentially through the table or even worse through the section of text. Um, another important point is the fact that the statistical analysis is a black box because uh, although there uh, may be a lot of uh, details uh, provided in the paper, we are still at the issue that we cannot actually see the code. And uh, as a result, uh, to actually reproduce the analysis, we would need to re-implement it. So what would overcome all uh, of these limitations? Well, that would be a living uh, runnable paper. That is just another way to define an executable research article. So um, those are able to actually embed code inside the paper. And uh, actually they can be accessed through a very common tool that is a browser. In fact, uh, these days, uh, is executable research articles are uh, um, rendered through Jupyter notebooks. And notebooks have become a very popular object, but uh, if you are not familiar with those, essentially they are uh, um, objects able to combine code, visualization and text in a single document. Most people are familiar with Jupyter, but actually there are uh, uh, many uh, notebook systems apart from Jupyter. And most of them uh, allow the user to actually choose a language they want to use. And some of them are even polyglot, meaning that uh, actually you can mix up different languages uh, in, uh, in a single document. So I'm talking about uh, executable research articles because we recently published uh, a, a, an interactive meta-analysis, meaning that it was a meta-analysis that uh, heavily relied on uh, interactive visualization tools. Uh, the topic was um, the validation of MRI biomarkers through, through histology. And uh, um, we used mostly Python with some bits of R, of course, for uh, the heavy uh, statistical part. And um, we relied a lot on Plotly, that is an amazing graphing, graphic library that allows you to actually uh, produce this uh, uh, amazing uh, um, visualization that I will show you. Let's start with something uh, that is very basic for uh, this kind of work. So um, representing the, the screening procedure. So here we use the Sankey diagram. You can see that you can interact with the, the plot. Uh, and for each stage of the screening procedure, you can see how many studies we had. And if you over on the connections between the stages, you can see wh which were the exclusion criteria moving from one stage to the other. Then uh, to actually um, represent uh, in a different way than a table, the studies that we selected for uh, the meta-analysis, we used a tree map. This is an interactive tree map, so you can interact with it. And as you can see, it's organized in different sections. So first you have the structure of interest, then the condition of the tissue, and then the species. And then you can click on one that interests you, and then you can go and see the details. And you even have the link that will bring you directly to, to the paper. Tree maps can also be used to actually show how uh, there may be contrasts uh, in some studies. For example, here we are using a tree map where the color is representing the effect sides that in our case was the coefficient of determination. And the size of each container is actually proportional to the sample size. So for example, you can notice if there are studies where the uh, effect size is big, but the sample size is small. And uh, this kind of uh, information can also be showed through a bubble plot where the size of the bubble will be proportional to uh, the sample size. And here you will have the FX size. And again, you can interact with the plot and retrieve the information for each bubble. These were all uh, kind of qualitative plots. Now, uh, moving to more the quantitative part, uh, since we use the mixed effect model and we represent the results using a forest plot, in Plotly, you don't have uh, uh, forest plots per se, but we are realized those using uh, a combination of scatter plots. And I think that the results are quite interesting. So again, you can interact with the plot, you can look at the overall uh, estimate range and also at the prediction interval. 
And finally, since on top of the mixed effect model, we run the, some uh, um, pairwise comparisons, how to represent those, we use uh, some heat maps. And here again, you can interact and see all the information you may be interested in. So how does it actually look uh, as a paper? So we can see it here. So um, for now, it looks like uh, an ordinary paper. But when uh, you actually get to a figure, you will be able to see that first. The figure is interactive, as we have seen in the presentation. And then uh, you can actually expand the code. And the amazing thing is that you can actually change the code and, see, and rerun the document and see what happens. So one question that many may have is uh, where you can actually publish these uh, ERAs. So um, two journals that are currently accepting ERAs are eLife for the life sciences and the upcoming OHBM Aperture for neuroscience. Then there are dedicated platforms like Stensila, CodeOcean, and the nonprofit Neurolibra. In particular, Stensila is the one supporting the, the eLife journal. But finally, I think that uh, even if uh, you publish a, a normal paper and then you, um, you share this kind of objects through GitHub, it's in any case uh, an added value to, to the study. And uh, if you are curious about how to publish this, uh, these objects, uh, Conkol and colleagues uh, published this uh, very interesting review. So to conclude, thank you for the attention. I would like to thank you to thank all my colleagues. And if you are curious about it, please ask any question and get in touch if you want with my email or through my blog where I explained a bit about how to make some of these objects. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mario. That was really excellent and something that I learned about recently through Neil, actually. Um, and I think that the this interactivity is just really important for users. And I love that the code for the figures is shared with us immediately within the article. So now if um, all panelists and discussants could turn on their camera, if you're comfortable with that, um, because there's not much need for me to talk more as we have some wonderful discussants for you today. Um, and those discussants are David Moher, Elaine Toomey and Tamara Lofty. Um, David Moher is a senior scientist of the Clinical Epidemiology Programme at Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, where he directs the Centre for Journalology. And then Elaine Toomey is a lecturer in the School of Allied Health in the University of Limerick. She's also a Cochrane Ireland Research Associate and a member of both the Health Research Institute and the Health Behaviour Change Research Group in Ireland. And then Tamara Lofty is the coordinator of the Global Evidence Synthesis Initiative, GESI, um, which is hosted by the American University of Beirut. She is a medical doctor and a public health professional. So we have a question um, from Jacob on Slack that I might go to you, David Moher, for as it's very related to the last talk um, and potentially many of your own interests. And that is, how can we find a compromise between creating open live systematic reviews and meta-analyses and the academic obligation to publish papers and journals with an impact factor? Uh, I think my, I don't, I don't know whether you can hear me. Yep. You can, okay, because my internet uh, connection isn't, uh, isn't great. So uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the question, a super important question. And um, yes, it's uh, publish or perish is not simply a myth. Um, it's a reality and it's a, a, a tremendous reality for early career researchers who are you know, trying to uh, advance their careers. And, and I think what it's going to take is a, a sort of an ecosystem change where we uh, actually move away from uh, counting um, publications and counting meaningless uh, impact factors to thinking about um, what may be uh, of greater societal importance. So, um, you know, there's a lot of great people who've done some work in this area. I've just shared a link um, to uh, Dora which is the Declaration uh, for Research Assessment. This group has done a lot of work. If you go and have a look at their website, and, and I think what you could do is 
uh, a number of things. One is you could find an open science champion at your own institution and, and work with them to try to bring this to the leadership of the university or institution that you're at. You can try and create a, an, an open science grassroots group that will, will sort of bring open science up to the leadership and try to uh, permeate it uh, through the Institute. I think you can definitely use um, things like COVID-19 uh, as an example. There are uh, three very important vaccine trials that have been published. Uh, not one of those trials is the data available. So uh, we don't know very much about it. And that's um, not particularly useful for society. And so you, we need to move away to rewarding things like data sharing, a lot of fantastic discussion and a presentation here today, open data, open methods, et cetera. Um, I'll stop there because I know there's lots of other great questions. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, David. I think, um, Mario, because your presentation is so applicable, you might have a few things to say on this as well. Yeah, thank you, uh, Shara. Um, I wanted to add that I think that slowly, um, it depends of the, on the field, uh, of course, but slowly research is kind of going there in uh, the sense that uh, um, there are journals that are st start asking for uh, uh, the source code, then uh, they would uh, add uh, uh, this kind of uh, Jupyter notebooks, for example, to, to a publication. And this is the case also for uh, uh, high impact, uh, impact journal. So I think that uh, although the overall system may be part of the problem, yeah. uh, I think that the incentivate these, uh, these efforts uh, will, uh, will get there eventually. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and Elaine, if I can come to you um, first and then we can open it up to a wider discussion. Um, but I want to hear some of your thoughts because I know you're an evidence synthesis methodologist and whether you think that we are moving quickly enough towards um, the, these open synthesis principles that Neil outlined in his talk. Um, or do we first need to build a fuller appreciation of what open synthesis actually means? Yeah, and thanks very much for, for having me here. Really appreciate it. It's been a really fantastic um, day so far and fantastic set of talks. So, yeah, I think that's a great question, Kira. So I think, um, like, from all the examples we've seen here, um, I think the future is bright. And I think, as Matteo says, we will get there. But I think there are some important bits that we need to consider, first of all. And I suppose I kind of come at this from a behavioral science lens. So I think kind of coming from that, always the thing is, what, does what do we need what who who needs to do what differently in order for something to to change and I think it does tie in a little bit to what David was talking about and to what Alessandra was or Alexandra was talking about in terms of the research ecosystem and that I think there's two kind of big things to consider and one is the the target stakeholder group so you know awareness might be growing among this community here but what about awareness for journals, for institutions, for um, PIs, for you know, senior researchers? So I think that's maybe the first thing to consider is awareness beyond kind of this traditional group or people who are interested in evidence synthesis. Um, and then I think, and, and I suppose how we can facilitate that awareness and that understanding growing. Um, and then I think the second bit then for me is, is beyond awareness itself. So awareness and understanding is brilliant, but then beyond that, you still have, I suppose, lots of other different factors which will influence whether change will occur or not. So things like skills and training. So we might have the awareness and understand how to do it, but we mightn't actually physically be able to, to run these things um, or to, to use the software. So I think the training and skills piece of it. And then I think coming back to what David was talking about a lot is the incentives and the motivation to do it. So we might have the awareness, we might have the skills, but there might be no motivation or incentive whatsoever to get there. And I think a big piece of it is, is the cultural um, side of things. And I think, um, you know, things are going that way. I think as open science shifts that way, I think open synthesis will shift that way. Um, so maybe there's 
a bit of work around what the key principles are for open synthesis and in the shift towards open science in our universities institutions that we can bring that along and say if some of us are teaching students um, evidence synthesis that we're starting to kind of open the door to these types of here's how you can be transparent all the way across your systematic review and maybe even just starting with small things like you know for students we've started making them all facilitating them all to put their um, protocols up in OSF and, you know, just even that one step just to get that, you know, becoming a bit of a norm for, th for those projects. So um, I'll stop now as well and let other people jump in. That, that was brilliant and I couldn't agree with you more um, on, on all of those points. Um, I'm sure Neil has a few things to say um, with, the, with the open synthesis element of that. Yeah, I'll just keep it short, actually. Um, just thinking about... Um, Incentives, I think there's ways to think about it. There's barriers and there's incentives and we can reduce some of the barriers by making it easier. Um, and in response to, to Jakob's point about whether, whether you should go for the impact factor traditional um, journal or whether to go open with these different um, ways, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think you can publish in a traditional um, journal and if you really want to you can publish in a traditional journal that's behind a paywall and you can make all of your research freely accessible and open by using repositories by using um you know building websites that you can do in github um and to communicate your science openly along with a paper i think the days of publishing a paper and that paper being the communication on its own are uh, nearing an end if they're not over already that's not how we communicate research that's not how you meet your end users how you send your results to your end users and have a conversation with them it's much more interactive and there's many other ways which include open uh, principles that then allow you to sort of circumvent this archaic system that um, that seems closed I don't think it's mutually exclusive Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, Tamara's had to drop off, but there was um, a general question um, from Slack that perhaps uh, we as a group could discuss. Um, and it was around whether or not there um, were potential risks for open synthesis in um, low and middle income countries um, and whether that might be harder to embrace. Um, Tamara has left um, a comment on, in the chat. So I think She'll be okay with me reading that out. And she said that, of course, open synthesis will come with its challenges to low and middle income countries. Um, but the crucial thing is to include those researchers in the discussion on methods, tools and plans, um, engage in the thinking and provide equal opportunities to test and upgrade. So I think that's a really important message around equity. Um, and something that we should all be thinking about as well. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to add anything to that. Um, but if not, I'll, I'll go on to some questions that we have for um, the presenters. So um, the first question um, will came through from Luke for Mark. Um, so Mark, how do we balance the tension between making plots as human friendly as possible so that the information is communicated well um, and making them machine readable on the assumption that someone might want to extract this data in the future? I, I really don't know. I wish there was a solution to this. Um, you know, a, a crucial part of being a scientist is just um, being very clear in presenting your outcomes and a figure is what, one of the main tools we use to make sense of what we um, discuss and find in our research papers. And so uh, convincing someone, well, first off, convincing someone that doesn't share their data to open up their figures to allow machine readable uh, tools to extract data from the plots, I think is going to be a uh, an, an unusual task because they've already convinced that they don't want to share their data. And so my advice is, uh, my plan is to like pull together a best practices just to avoid certain things. I mean, like I already itemized a bunch of um, typical hangups when you, when you wanna develop these semi-automated tools. Uh, but, the, but, but also practically a point that I did not make was um, most meta analysts, people extracting data, they don't come into situations where they need something mega fancy to extract data from plots. I mean, all you need is a digital ruler. 
And if that's the case for most figures in publications, then maybe the semi-automated tools making them machine readable is just um, is just for the special cases where there's a, there's a lot of information that you need to extract. I mean, I'm hoping to pull that stuff together, um, but yeah, that's a tension I feel like I I deal with all the time when I'm trying to pull together a manuscript and certainly thinking about um, how someone can use the data, the figure data downstream, if the data, if the raw data is not open access, maybe it's something that, you know, journals could start adopting and, or at least reviewers being more explicit in saying, hey, you know what, your figures, you're not plotting the axes on your figures. What's going on here? <laughs> Thank you so much. Neil, we'll go to you. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, just as a reiterate that, that point, I really agree. And um, that's why I was really excited to see Matteo's um, work when I came across it in eLife. And I wanted to um, just share something that Brian Nozek um, goes on about a bit um, with open science in general, that there's a, um, an evolution of adoption of or practices that can help adoption of concepts like open science. He says, make it possible, make it easy, make it normative, make it rewarding and make it required. And that sequence is really important. And I think it's exactly the same in um, evidence synthesis, but we might already be about, uh, ahead of the game with some of those, because um, as I said in my talk, evidence synthesis uh, know how difficult it is to extract data from papers. Um, and I also wanted to say that um, in a systematic map that I did recently, I've just switched to using um, R markdown files, which combine R and markdown, and I write my results in the markdown. So I have the text of the results, and all I need to do is just upload it, not even uploading, I just need to point it towards a new systematic map database with all of the rows of studies and the descriptive information, and it rewrites the results as I'm going, as I'm tidying, I can write the results, as I am still doing uh, bibliographic checking and just putting a few extra studies in. Um, that's useful for me, but it's also then open because someone can come along and see for a map or for a review exactly how I got that figure because you know, the underlying data is, is dependent, the code is there, it's entirely replicable. So this is exactly Matteo's process. I think. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we have a question then for you, Tom, and it's from Sarah via Slack. Um, and it's for the automatic data extraction, roughly how many reviews um, first need to be done manually to adequately train the algorithm or does that just depend? Uh, so it definitely does depend. Uh, different projects have a easier and, and more difficult time being modeled. Um, on Sysrev, the way the way modeling works is the model actually drives the priority of review. So if you have your reviewers reviewing articles, um, after they've reviewed about 30 articles, a machine learning process is kicked off and a model is created. Uh, and then the future article reviews are prioritized according to the articles that the model uh, predicts with most ambivalence. So, you know, like a 50% probability of inclusion for screening. Um, sometimes models won't work at all. Of course, you can think of like a hypothetical example where, you know, you have two reviewers in a project and they agree to disagree about every single uh, label they apply to an article. In that case, a model won't work. Uh, so we try to uh, keep everything really transparent on Sysrev. And I think that's, that's something to just pay attention to with modeling in general. Uh, you know, you can never just trust uh, models to, you know, provide correct answers uh, to everything. Um, anyone who's selling you a service where they say after you've uh, labeled 30 articles, the machine will do everything. Um, it's sadly, it's not true. It doesn't work that way. Um, so yeah, I, I could go on, but I, I think that the short answer is after you've labeled 30 articles uh, for very simple tasks, a model probably starts getting an idea uh, and if you want very good models on complex tasks, you can need thousands or tens of thousands of reviews. So it certainly varies. 
Thank you. Um, that's excellent. I'm always so intrigued to learn more anyway about CISREV. Um, this is a behavioural question, so I might jump to you first, um, Elaine, and then back to David, because it was in relation to David's point, but it was a, a question around data sharing. And if we are asking authors to change behaviour, would a better option be to ask them to share the underlying data so we don't have to extract it at all? I see lots of nodding heads. I'm not sure if you see that on YouTube, but I'll go to, I'll go to Elaine so she can articulate that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I absolutely agree. So I think, and then if you're looking at what level that's, you know, targeting, that's, I suppose, working with the journals to ensure that that's a requirement in their journal. So, you know, we've done some kind of like looking at journals to see what's their, what's their, you know, adherence to the top guidelines. And in terms of do they mandate data sharing? Or do they encourage it? Do they facilitate it? And it varies widely across lots of different journals. And, you know, even within, we looked at pain, pain journals. So it varies widely, even within that small subset. So then I think you're looking at your journals and what, you know, how you work with journal editors to get them to implement that policy. But then I think you also flip side need to look at how do we support authors to be able to do that. So, you know, do we have enough training sessions around that that facilitates our ECRs, our senior researchers who are maybe coming to this from 20 years of not doing it? So, you know, how can we facilitate them on one hand and then how do we mandate it on the other hand? So I think, you know, you do need to look at, I suppose, the, the biggest picture, the bigger picture overall and try and target it from lots of different angles, I think. And then institutionally, do they reward their researchers for sharing data? Is that part of promotion progression criteria like David was talking about? So I think it's looking at all the different angles to see how you can enable that behaviour change to occur. Thank you. Another brilliant answer from you, Elaine. And um, David, if you don't mind going to you for, for any additional points on that. Sure. Uh, so I, I have nothing too much to add. I, I just want to say that um, I, I forget the name of the person who mentioned it sort of depends by field. And I think that's very true. In medicine, uh, we're very far behind data sharing. There are two prominent journals that have very stringent data sharing policies, Plus Medicine and BMJ. Uh, the other 24,000 journals in, in, uh, in, in, in my space uh, don't do that. Uh, I think there is an added complication that if, you know, if I was in an in-person room uh, giving a talk and I asked people for a show of hands, uh, you know, do, do people in, in principle think data sharing is good? You, you're probably going to get 80% uh, of people to say yes. But if I actually ask people, do you know how to do it? I think you may get five people. So we really need the resources. We need to actually help people do that. And there are some universities like Tilburg, a technical university in the Netherlands. They have a concept called data champions where they help people share their data and that helping can be used as part of their promotion and tenure portfolio. So we, we need to be innovative uh, in, in how that can happen, but we really need to think about uh, is data sharing a, a greater societal benefit than a journal impact factor? Of course it is. But back to my point is that the three vaccine trials that have been done for COVID-19, the data is not available. So when you go to a high impact factor journal like the New England Journal of Medicine, where the Pfizer trial is published, you, they have a data sharing statement. But if you want to get the data, you have to apply to Pfizer, which is absolutely you no know, guarantee that you will get the data. In a major global public health importance, you cannot get the data. Thank you so much. Um, and I would love to continue this conversation on forever, but we are getting towards the end of our time. And I would be remiss not to ask what the people want to know, Mark. Um, so we've had a question from Wolfgang Wiesberg and he wants to know the story behind your setup um, and let us have a little bit of your secret so that we can replicate. Oh boy, I, uh, <laughs> I use uh, Twitch. OBS software. So if you have like, if you ever watch that stuff, people speed racing games and stuff like that, this is what I use. And it's very dynamic. I could do whatever I want, you know, switch between things quickly, have videos, have all this stuff kind of tickle down. I could switch courses, right? Let's see if this works. 
Right. So this is a course I'm teaching right now in parasitology. I got my intro stuff. I mean, it's all done. And so I could just record it on the spot without any post processing, post editing. It's all done right away. So Twitch. <laughs> Love it. I think we're going to see a lot of um, similar <laughs> setups maybe for next year's conference. Um, so that was a really great presentation, everyone. And thank you so much to all the presenters and discussants on what I find a really interesting topic um, and something that I hope continues on Twitter and um, via the Slack channel. Um, so now at 3 p.m. GMT, we're, we have a selection of workshops for you to attend, um, either on GitHub, collaborating to reduce research waste, or another on systematic review coordinating buddies and how they can help you.